Hello everyone, a very 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 good morning. Let me see if I'm live. So I am very much live guys, uh, a very warm welcome to the class, बहुत 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 स्वागत है आप सबका a very good morning to all of you as well, I'm sorry we were a little late but there was some technical issue that we were facing, because of that हम थोड़ा सा late हो गए हैं लेकिन don't worry we are back and we will continue with our class, so before you all continue, before we start, I would request everyone to join us on Telegram. Uh, the link has been given below and at the same time you have the scan code. So, aap dono mein se koi bhi use kar sakte hain aur uh, Telegram group ko join kar sakte hain. Why is it important to join the Telegram group? Because this is where you will get updates regarding the classes. You can talk to the teachers, you can access your notes as well. So, this is going to be a really a uh, good way this is going to be a really good method uh, through which uh, you can stay connected with us and before you all start i would request everyone to do subscribe to the channel and like the video share the video if there's anything you would want us to add if there's anything you want us to convey uh, do let us know in the comment section and also press the bell notification on so that you get updated whenever we post a new video and also guys please subscribe to the channel because that would really mean a lot to us so all right let's start with the session so yesterday i was introducing you with maha janapadas i uh, so what all have we done i gave you a brief timeline from that timeline we understood the difference between maha janapadas and janapadas then we got to know about the ganas and the sanghas and the kingdoms then we dealt with 16 maha janapadas some of them were left we still have to do uh, the 16 Mahajanapadas. I told you about the Janapad, the Mahajanapad, the capital, where is it located in the present day scenario, what are all its features, all of that has to be remembered. So today we will continue with our discussion on the Mahajanapadas and then what we will do? After that we will continue our discussion on the Mauryan Empire as well. So we will be talking about, we will be continuing, so we will be taking one of the most important Mahajanapadas today and we will continue with our discussion discussion of that. So chalye, let's start. Okay, so I think we had finished till Kuru and we have to start from uh, here. We have to start from Matsya. Alright, so let's begin. Okay, so as you can see, As you can see, uh, we will be talking about uh, Matsya now. So Matsya, what is the capital? The capital is Viratnagar. This is the capital. It is located, present day location is in Jaipur. Now it is situated to the west of the Panchalas and south of Kuru. Uh, the capital was at Viratnagar, which is modern day Bairat. It is situated near present day Jaipur, Alwar, Bharatpur area of Rajasthan. So all of these areas, so Matsya actually combines all of these areas. So Jaipur, Alwar, Bharatpur. So you can imagine how big it must have been. Jaipur itself is so huge and then we have Alwar and Bharatpur as well. And who was the founder of this particular Mahajanpad? The founder was a person named Virat. So I'm sure you won't have any issues remembering this. So you can remember it through Virat Kohli. So that's all about your Matsya. Let's talk about Chedi. Chedi, uh, the capital was Sothivati. And where is it located? Present day, it is located in the Bundelkhand region. So again, Bundelkhand region, I'm sure you'll be able to remember through uh, Jhansi Ki Rani because uh, she was uh, Bundele Har Bolo Ke Nu Hamne Suni Kahani Thi. Khub Ladi Mardani Wo To Jhansi Wali Rani Thi. So that's, that's the Bundelkhand that we are talking about. 
Now this region has been mentioned in the Rig Veda. The capital is Sotivati. Now these are different names which have been used for the capital. So please remember these names because you might get this in your MCQ. So we have Shuktimati. We have Sothi Vati Nagara. So these are the names which have been used. So please remember these names because they can definitely come for your MCQ part. It is located in present day Bundelkhand region which is central India. King, uh, the name of the king was Shishupal and he was killed by Vasudev Krishna during the Rajasyu Yagya sacrifice of the Pandav king Yudhishthir. So Yudhishthir was, uh, was organizing this Rajasyu Yagya and uh, during that point of time, uh, King Shishupal was killed by uh, Vasudev Krishna, which is Krishnji. Alright, let me know if you have any doubts here guys, if there is anything you don't understand. You can just let me uh, know in the comments section, sorry, in the live chat session. Okay, there seems to be no doubt. Let's move ahead now. Okay, the next uh, one that we have to deal with is Avanti or uh, the capital was Ujjaini or Maheshmati. So I'm sure, again, this won't be an issue for anyone to remember because we all know Maheshmati. We all know uh, Bahubali. Okay? We all know Maheshmati uh, ki pata ka sada yuhi. Gagan Chume, so I'm sure you'll be able to remember it. So Avanti, the capital was Ujjaini or also known as Maheshmati. Now, where is it located present day? It is located in Malwa and Madhya Pradesh. That is the present day location. So Avanti was significant in relation to the rise of Buddhism. So Avanti plays a very important role uh, in the rise of Buddhism. The capital of Avanti was located at Ujjaini and Maheshmati. So, the capital of Avanti, the northern part, the, the capital of northern part was Ujjaini, okay? And the capital of southern part was Maheshmati. So, you have to remember this, that southern or northern part ka kaun sa tha, don't forget. No, southern part was Maheshmati and northern part was Ujjaini. Now, it is situated in present-day Malwa and Madhya Pradesh. Who is the important king here? The important king is Prayodhata and he was the father-in-law of Udhyayana, which is the king of the Vastas. Alright? Let's talk about Gandhar. Again, I think I'm sure you're aware of this. You're aware of uh, Gandhar from Mahabharat because it has been mentioned in Mahabharat because Gandhari belonged to this place. Alright? So what is the capital of Gandhar? The capital of Gandhar is Takshila. Present day it is located in Rawalpindi. The capital was at Takshila or Takshashila. Uh, present day location is modern Peshawar, Rawalpindi, Pakistan and Kashmir Valley. Gandhar is cited in Atharva Ved. These people were highly trained in the art of war. Okay. It was significant for international commercial activities because obviously... Uh, you could have uh, trade relations with the west of Asia through this area as well. Who is the important king? The important king, king is Pushkara Sarin and Gandhar was conquered by the Persians in the later part of the 6th century BCE. So hence we lost uh, Gandhar to the Persians. But yes, initially it was definitely part of India and definitely a part of our uh, epics as well as you have seen in Mahabharata. Okay, let me know if you have any doubts here, otherwise we'll continue.
Okay. All right. Let's move ahead. Okay. The next uh, uh, Mahajan Pada is Kamboj. Uh, the capital was Poonch. And where is it located? Rajori and Hajra, which is in Kashmir. And Northwest Frontier Province, which is Pakistan. The capital of Kamboj was Poonch. And it is uh, present date is located in Kashmir and Hindu Kush. Several literary sources mentioned that Kamboj was a republic. That means it was ruled by a Gana or a Sangh. And Kamboj had an excellent breed of horses. So that's what it is majorly known for. Then we have uh, Asmaka or Asaka. And what was the capital? The capital was Potali or Podana. And where is it located? It is located on the banks of Godavari. Okay, it was located on the banks of River Godavari. And it was the only Mahajanapada situated to the south of the Vindhya range, which was in Dakshin Pat. So, this is the only, so most of the Mahajanapadas that we have talked about, most of the Mahajanapadas are situated in the northern part, guys. Okay? Where is it situated? It is situated in the northern part, fine. But here you can see that this is the only one which is situated in the Dakshin Pat, which is the southern area of India. It included the region of uh, Pratishthan or Paitan as well. Okay, so these are other two uh, that we talked about. Let me know if you have any doubts, otherwise we'll cut. Okay, let's move ahead. Now, next is Vajji. And uh, you already know that Vajji was uh, a Gana or a Sangh, which, is, which, was, which means it was ruled by a Gana or a Sangh. Okay? So, where is the capital? The capital is Vaishali. And where is it located present day? Present day, it is located in Bihar. Fine? North of Ganga is the division of Tirhut, which was the state of the Vajji. So, it is located north of Ganga. It is... Included eight clans, uh, eight clans, and the most powerful was the Lichavis, where the capital was uh, Vaishali. Okay, then we have the Vidihans, the capital was Mithila, and then we have the Natkiras, where the capital was on Kundapura. Kundapura. So these are the most powerful clans, and each clan had their own capital. Okay, so Lichavi, the capital was Vaishali. Vidihans, the capital was Mithila. Then we have Nat, uh, Natrikas, the capital was in Kundapura. Now, Mahavir belonged to the Natrikas clan. So now you know how Mahavir, why Mahavir was so important because he already belonged to a very important uh, clan. Fine. The Vajis were defeated by Ajat Shatru. Okay. Let's talk about Malla then. Malla and uh, where is it? Where is the capital? The capital is Kusinara. And where is it located? Present day it is located in Deriwa or Uttar Pradesh. It finds reference in Buddhist and Jain text and in Mahabharat also. It was a republic, meaning it was governed by a Gana or a Sangha. Its territory touched the northern border of the Vajji state. Capitals are Kusinara and Pava. Both capitals are important in the history of Buddhism. Uh, the Buddha took his last meal at uh, Pava and he went to, and he went, uh, he also achieved his Mahaparinibbana in Kusinara or Kusinagra. So you can, uh, the both, both the uh, pronunciations is correct. So you can see that this uh, place is important from the Brahminical point of view as well and from the Buddhist point of view as well. So that is the most important, I would say it's a very important Mahajanapada. Okay, let me know if you have doubts in any of these two, otherwise we'll continue. So with this, we have finished the 16 Mahajanapadas, guys. I know there's a lot to remember, but there's nothing we can do. You have to remember these. 
okay so that's what uh, it is about so let me know if you have any doubts otherwise we'll continue and we'll move on to see the political structure that was there in the mahajanapadas and after that we will move on to the mauryas All right, shall we, guys? Let's now move on to see the political structure of the Mahajanapada. See, I've already told you quite a bit about them. Uh, I've already told you that how some of them were ruled by monarchs, how some of them were ruled by ganas and sanghas. All right. So let's see, you know, let's see a little more in detail about the armies, about the taxation, all of those things. So majority of the states were monarchs, but some were known as ganas and sanghas and were republics. This you already know. The king was elected and ruled with the help of a council called ganas and sanghas, which were oligarchies. Now, Vajji was a powerful mahajanapada, which was ruled by the sangha system. So till here, you're already very much aware, guys. So I don't think मुझे explain करने की जरूरत है. So just I hope you guys have understood till here. Okay. So till here, I hope everyone is clear. Now, from republican state came the founders of Jainism and Buddhism. Each Mahajanapada had its own capital. Obviously, we have already taken a look at the sixteen Mahajanapadas. We know that each of them had its own capital, and sometimes they had two capitals for the north and the south region. For security reasons, most of the rulers or the ganas and sanghas. Uh, would fortify their uh, forts. Would fortify their capitals. Fine. The new kings maintained regular armies. Fine. And to maintain regular armies, what did they do? They obviously took taxes from the people, and taxes were usually in the form of crops, or usually in the form of kind. So crops were taxed at one sixth of their value. Means whatever. You have earned by selling the crops. One sixth of that you have give you have to give to the king. Now, this was referred to as bhag or share. <coughs> Sorry, guys. This was referred to as what? This was referred to as bhag or sharing. What do you mean by this? So this was the bhag or the share of the king. Now. Craftsmen, herders, hunters, traders—all of these people were subject to taxes. So there was no profession that would not have to pay taxes. All of them had to pay taxes. Okay. Out of the sixteen Mahajanapadas, Magadh emerged as the most powerful Mahajanapad. Okay. Why it happened? That I will tell you. And it was—it was the most powerful under the rule of Bimbisar. And established a vast empire by conquering most of the Mahajanapadas, which we'll get to know about in detail when we start doing the modern empire. Eventually, Magadh became the center of political activity in North India, with the coming in of the Mauryas particularly. All right, and the Magadh was the first empire in India. Please remember this point: that which was the first empire in India, Magadh was the first empire in India. Why was it so important? What all has happened that I will tell you. First of all, just uh, let me finish this. Okay, sorry. 
uh, just let me know if you have any doubts here and then I will tell you how the Mauryas become the most important Mahajanapadas. All of this we have already studied. That is why I have not gone in a lot of details to explain you. But still if you have doubts, you can let me know. All right, Shelly. Uh, let's move ahead then. Okay. So now, how do you think Magat became the most important Mahajanapada? There are certain reasons for that. Okay. First of all, they had iron mines, which made it really easy for them to make weapons and tools. Okay. That was one of the main reasons why it became such an important Maha, important Mahajanapada. Then we have fertile agriculture. Remember guys, they fall in the northern belt. Alright, getting huge rainfall. Bahut acha, uh, rainfall aata hai in sabko. And when they get good amount of rainfall, they're also very good producers of rice. Fine. So they have very good fertile agriculture. They had dense forest and from there, those dense forests, they could capture elephants and elephants played a very important role in the armed forces. Uh, sometimes they were decisive to the victories. Okay. Apart from this, obviously they were situated in the Ganga Valley. Where were they situated? They were situated in the Ganga Valley. Now, since you're situated in the Ganga Valley, first of all, obviously, it will be a fertile region because of that. And most importantly, it will also be what? Most importantly, it will also uh, have, it will also serve as cheap modes of communication and transportation uh, outside of the empire as well and within the empire itself. Okay. So now let us see, uh, let us talk about one of the most important or let us talk about the first empire of uh, Magadh. All right. Let's talk about the most important dynasty which had ruled over Magadh and that is the Mauryas. Now before the Mauryas came into power, it was the Nanda empire who was ruling. And who was the last ruler of the Nanda dynasty? It was Maha Padmananda. All right. Or Dhananand, he was really, really unpopular due to his oppressive tax regime. So he was taxing his people in the worst manner possible. He was taking a lot of taxes from them and that is why he was really, really unpopular. Okay. Also post Alexander's invasion in Northwest India, the region faced a lot of unrest from foreign powers. So after Alexander's invasion, there was a lot of uh, unrest from foreign powers as in there was always this chance that some or the other foreign power would come and try to colonize us or try to conquer us. Some of these regions were under the rule of the Seculiar dynasty founded by Seleucus Nicator. He was one of the generals of Alexander the Great. 
So some of these regions, so some of Indian regions did come under the Seleucid dynasty and uh, he, the founder was Seleucus Niketa. He was the general of Alexander the Great. And if you remember guys, Chandragupta married his daughter, uh, bringing peace between both the houses. So Chandragupta, with the help of an intelligent and politically astute Brahmin called Kotilya or Chanakya, he usurped the throne by defeating Dhananda in 321 BCE. So who led the foundations? Who laid the foundations of the modern dynasty? It was laid by the it was laid by Chandragupta Maurya with the help of Chanakya or Kotilya. Okay. So let me move ahead and then we can clear some doubts together. So who was the founder of the modern empire? The founder of the modern empire was Chandragupta Maurya. So let's see uh, what Chandragupta Maurya, what is his backstory? Now I'm sure you are aware of his backstory that there was this small child who was sitting on a raised rock. He was acting as a king and there were certain people sitting down and he was literally uh, delegating, he was literally giving them justice. And Chanakya saw him and he realized that this person is going to make the best king possible. And his mission became such that he had to make him the king of Magadh. All right, that's the story. But we don't really know how it actually happened. So let's see what we are trying to understand here. So Chandragupta's uh, origin is shrouded in mystery. We don't know from where he was, how he came to be. Okay. The Greek sources, which are the oldest, mention him to be of a non-warrior lineage. So definitely he was not a Kshatriya. The Hindu sources say that he was a student of Kautilya of a humble birth. Maybe he was born to a Shudra woman. Could be possible. We don't know about his birth. And, but most of the Buddhist sources say that he was a Kshatriya. Okay? So we don't really know what he actually was. We don't, we don't really have any idea who he actually was. Not who, uh, but what his background was. That we definitely don't know. It is generally accepted that he was an orphaned boy from a humble family. So most probably from a Shudra background. Who was trained by Kautilya. Now, uh, Greek accounts also mention him as Sandrokotos. All right. So, Greek uh, jo accounts hai, usko kese mention karte hai? they mention him as Sandrokotos. Alexander had abandoned his Indian conquest in 324 BC. And within a year, Chandragupta had defeated some of the Greek ruled cities in the northwestern part of the country. So, uh, as soon as Alexander had abandoned his Indian conquest, but do, that did not mean that the Greeks have not established empires here. They had. Seleucus Nicator was one of them. Chandragupta took it upon himself and he defeated some of the uh, Greek ruled cities in the northwestern part of the country. Kautilya was the one who provided the strategy and Chandragupta was the one who uh, executed it. And he raised a mercenary army of their own. What do you mean by mercenary army? Mercenary army is not a standing army. They will fight for you when they are paid. Okay? Then, after dealing with these uh, Indo-Greek rulers, he moved towards Magadha. In a series of battles, he defeated Dhananda. So, it was not just in one battle, guys. It was in a series of battles. And he laid down the foundations of the modern empire in 321 BC. Please remember these dates. These are important. Now, in 305, he entered into a treaty with Seleucus Niketer, in which Chandragupta acquired Balochistan, eastern Afghanistan and the region of the West Indus. And as a result of this, uh, whatever uh, agreement they had, he also married Seleucus Niketer's daughter, Helena. In return, Seleucus Nicator gave him 500 elephants. Again, you can see a decisive factor in the victory of the Mauryas. Seleucus Nicator avoided a full-scale war with the mighty Chandragupta. And in return, he got a lot of assets that obviously would have led, led him to victory against uh, his rival in the Battle of Ispus, Ipsus. All right. So basically, Chandragupta and uh, Seleucus Nicator played a safe game. 
they realize that they both can't fight each other and particularly Selicus Niketa realized that he can't really fight Chandragupta Maurya. So he decided to have a treaty signed and according to the treaty, he married his daughter so that Selicus Niketa would never attack uh, the Mauryan Empire. Fine. And then uh, he also got a lot of war assets. Who Selicus Niketa got a lot of war assets. Uh, from Chandragupta, which really helped Selicus in defeating his rivals in the Battle of Ipsus. Okay, so that's about the founder of the modern empire. Please let me know if you have doubts still here. Or let me just finish this and then we will take a look at the doubts together. Megasthenes was the Greek ambassador in the Chandragupta court. We all know that he's the writer of Indica. Chandragupta led a policy of expansion, brought India, brought under control almost all all of present India, barring a few places like Culling and Extreme South. So Culling and Extreme South, other than that, most of the places were under Chandragupta's rule. His reign lasted from 321 BC to 297 BC. So you can see he ruled for a very long time. Then what happened? He left his throne in favor of his son Bindusar. He left, he went to Karnataka, he became a Jain monk. And he starved himself to death, okay? According to the Jain tradition, he starved himself to death because he became a follower, he became a Jain follower. So that's how Chandragupta the Maurya ended, one of the best and the greatest rulers of the modern empire. Let me know if you have any doubts in these two slides. Okay, so I don't think there are any doubts. So let's move ahead. Now, who is the second ruler of modern empire? The second ruler of modern empire was Bindusar. He was the son of Chandragupta Maurya. He ruled from 297 to 273 BC. He did not rule for a very long time. All right. He is also known as the Amitra Ghata, which means slayer of foes means uh, someone who has slayed or killed all his enemies. He is also known as Amitra Shades in the Greek sources, which again means the same thing, someone who has killed all his enemies. Now, uh, Dimachus, who was the Greek ambassador in his court, he appointed his son Ashoka as the governor of Ujjain. Fine. And Bindusar has believed, it is believed that he extended the empire almost to Mysore. So we can see uh, uh, Chandragupta Maurya was not able to extend the empire till down south. The down south was still uh, independent or they were not part of the modern empire. But Bindusar was able to do so. Okay, that's about the second ruler, Bindusar. Let's continue, we'll clear some doubts together. Let's talk about the most important person who is the backbone behind the foundation of the modern empire. Had it not been him, we would not have even known or seen something as big or as beautiful or as wonderful as the modern empire. So he was the teacher of Chandragupta Maurya and also his chief minister. He was a teacher and scholar at Takshashila. Some of his other names are Vishnu, Gupta and Kotilya. Please remember these names because they are definitely bound to come in your uh, MCQs. 
he was also a minister in the court of Bindusar. So he continued with Bindusar as well. He is to be, he was the master strategist. He was the one who strategized everything against the uprising of the Nanda throne. And he is also one of the backbone person who was responsible for the rise of the modern empire. All right. He wrote Ardhashastra, which was a treatise on statecraft, economics and military strategy. Okay. So Ardhashastra, we all know that it was, uh, it is still available in parts. The entire book is not available. But it does act as a major source for us to understand the modern empire. Now, Ardhashastra was rediscovered. Now, these are very important points, guys. These are very important points. Hai. Please, isko mark kar lijega so that you don't forget. Till here. Now, so he wrote Ardhashastra. So, Ardhashastra was rediscovered by R. Shama Shastri in 1905 after it disappeared in the 12th century. So it disappeared. We do, we could not really find the books, and then it was rediscovered by our uh, Shama Shastri, and the book is actually available in parts. The entire book is not available. Other Shastra contain fifteen books with one eighty chapters, and the main theme is divided into different parts. So we have King, Council of Ministers, okay, the Department of Government, Civil and Criminal Law. And then we have diplomacy of war. So these are the basic chapters that is the, the, the book is divided into. Right? It also contains information about trade, markets, method to choose the ministers, spies, duties of the kings, ethics, social welfare, agriculture, mining, metallurgy, uh, medicine, forest, etc. So now you can see why it acts as a very important source for us. Even though Adhashastra actually means the art of economics, but it also acted much more than that. It tells us a lot about the modern empire. All right. And Chanakya has also been known as the Indian Machiavelli. Now, who's Machiavelli? Machiavelli is actually a Renaissance scholar. Uh, he has written some very uh, beautiful books. So, uh, Chanakya was known as the Indian Machiavelli. I think uh, Machiavelli should have been known as the European uh, Chanakya. But I don't know why is it like that. Any which way. Let, let me know if you have any doubts, guys, in the first these two slides. You can let me know in the live chat section. Now let's move on and talk about the central administration of the modern empire. Now here you have a lot of names. So please be careful. You have to remember these names. Now modern administration was highly centralized and emperor was the source of all power and authority. So he was assisted by... Oh, dear. I thought I missed some information. Anyway. So, the modern empire was highly centralized. The emperor was the source of all power and authority. Now, let us talk about his ministers. He was assisted by a council of ministers who were known as Mantri Parishad. And the ministers, individual ministers, they were known as Mantris. I'm sure you'll be able to remember this because these are the words we still used. Now, 
the council was headed by the mantri parishad adhyaksh who is like prime minister for today then we have the th so now let us see uh, what are the categories of the mantris that we have so first of all we have tithas the highest category of official in administration there were 18 tithas then we have adhyaksh they are ranked only next to tithas there were 20 adhyaksh they had economic and military functions we have mahasamant they were higher ranking officials then we have amatyas uh, amatya they are high ranking officials almost like present day secretaries they had administrative and judicial roles the adhyakshas formed into secretariat which was divided into many departments adh shastra mentioned many adhyaksha for commerce storehouse gold ships agriculture cows horses city chariots mint infantry etc so each of these department would have one adhyaksha or one head yuktas they are subordinate of officers responsible for the empire's revenue rajukas they are officers in charge of land measurement and boundary fixing then we have sanstha adhyaksh he is the superintendent of mint basically he is responsible for coins how many coins have been minted and everything then we have samasth adhyaksh he was the superintendent of markets now you will say ki ma'am isko kaise yaad kiya jaye there is nothing to do guys if you want to appear for your exams you have to remember all of these you have to remember the names all right so what have we learned till now we have learned that he, there was a council of ministers that was known as mantri parishad all right the council was headed by a mantri parishad adhyaksh okay in the mantri parishad there were different kinds of mantris so we have tithas they are uh, basically officials in administration then we have adhyaksh who is responsible for economic and military function mahasamant uh, high ranking officials amatyas high ranking officials like the present day secretaries they had administrative and judicial departments then adh shastra mentioned that all of these uh, you know departments like storehouses gold ships agriculture they all had their own adhyaksh fine yuktas were responsible for revenue rajukas were responsible for land measurement and boundary fixing then we have sanstha adhyaksh he was responsible for minting and samasthya adhyaksh was responsible for markets we have more let's finish this then we have vyavharika uh, mahamant they were judiciary officers so they were basically uh, responsible for justice we have polisanj people public relations officers pr a uh, registration of birth death foreigners industries trade manufacture of goods sales tax collection were all under the administration's control so you can see how each and every aspect of the life of the people was under the control of the administration okay let me know if you have any doubts here i know ye kafi complicated hai but there's nothing we can do try to learn it in parts try to learn it you know little uh, like try to learn it two three every day that's how you will be able to learn it let me know if you have any doubts here guys
let's move on to the local administration the smallest unit of administration was obviously the village who is the head of the village the gramika villages had a lot of autonomy so who is the head of the village the gramika then we have a uh, pradekshika he was the provincial governor or district magistrates or dm basically head of the district we have sthanika he is the tax collector at the village level we have durgpal he is the governor of forts we have antpal he is the governor of frontiers or boundaries we have the akshat uh, akshapa akshapatala he is the accountant general and then we have lipikaras who are the scribes so again you have to remember all of these guys ye sare officials aur ye jitne bhi hai aapko yaad hone chahiye so uh, the smallest unit of administration is village who is the head gramika is the head we have pradesh pradekshika he is the uh, district magistrate then we have sthanika he is the tax collector at the village level we have durgpal he is the governor of forts we have antpal he is the governor of frontiers we have akshatpal he is basically the accountant general and then we have the lipikaras they are basically responsible for scribing they are basically responsible for writing things down that is about the local administration okay let's move ahead let's talk about the army who was the commander in chief of all the in, of entire military the commander in chief of entire military was known as the senapati and his position was next to the emperor so just next to the emperor the most important person would be the senapati he was appointed directly by the emperor the army was divided into five sectors we have uh, infantry cavalry chariot elephant forces navy transport and provisions okay and the army salary was paid in cash that is a major major development for that point of time that army was being paid in cash now how was the revenue collected the revenue department chief was known as samharta uh, another important uh, official was sanidhat who was the treasurer revenue was collected on land irrigation shop customs forest ferry mines pastures so actually everyone had to pay some kind of revenue every profession had to pay some kind of taxes license fee was also uh, taken from artisans and fines were charged in the law courts so if you have done a mistake obviously you would be fined for it and most of the land revenue was fixed somewhere around 1/6 of the produce okay so where was it fixed it was fixed at 1/6 of the produce okay so that's about it so let me know if you have any doubts in local administration army and revenue any doubts guys anything you've not understood you can let me know in the live chat okay let's move ahead let's talk about police and espionage espionage is basically a spy system so police all the main centers had police headquarters obviously all the main centers of the empire jail was known as the bandagri bandhan gara or uh, bandigra theek hai and the lock up was known as the charaka theek hai so these are the differences jail is basically where you are sent for long term 
all right and lock up is something where you're locked up for your initial trial period unless and until you have been proven guilty let's talk about the espionage system which is uh, basically the spy system the espionage system was very well developed there were spies who informed the emperor about the bureaucracy in the market so every minister was actually spied the the spies would be informing the king about uh, what was happening in the bureaucracy about what was happening in the mantri parishad what was happening in the markets everything so there were two kinds of spies we have sansthana who was uh, one was you know they were stationary so they stayed at one place and gave information about uh, things then we have sanchari they were wanderers they went from place to place collecting information giving to the king now uh guda parushas were detectives or secret agents so they were detectives and they would be sent to uh different locations to spy on certain people or certain location like that fine they were controlled by maha matya pas parsarpa i know it's a difficult it's a little difficult to pronounce but that's how it is so they were all under the control of who they were all under the control of maha matya pas parsapara fine these agents were picked from different segments of the society so there was no differentiation as such fine and then there were agents also known as the wish kanyas who were the poisonous girls uh, aisa mana jata hai that they feed themselves what they feed themselves uh, uh the poison of snake and they are very poisonous and they can if you if they bite you you can die also so that's about it for today's lecture guys we have done quite a bit in detail about the modern empire i really really hope that you understood everything if there's anything that you have not understood you can tell me in the comment section for those who are watching it later you can let me know in the comment section if there's anything that you have not understood uh and uh, if there's anything you want me to explain again if you have any doubts Also, guys, I would request again all of you to join us on the Telegram group. The link has been given, the scan code has been given, so you can join us here because this is where you will get updates regarding the classes. This is where you will get your notes. This is where you can talk to the teachers. This is where you can request for doubt clearing sessions. We will have doubt clearing sessions, but according to exams, you can do that. And before you all leave, I would request everyone. to please like the video share it with your friends comment if there's anything you want us to add if there's anything you don't like or if there's anything you like we would be really happy to see your appreciation and also guys subscribe to the channel and do press the bell button so that you get notified every time we post a video and uh, it would really 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 make us happy really make me happy if you subscribe to the channel so that is something i would really request all of you to do so thank you so much for joining me in today's session and i will see you all tomorrow so thank you so much guys bye bye see you take care